So why is T-lift better than uh, lateral? Rob, this is for you. Okay. Have to have a little fun at the end of the day. So the actual talk is why are the current and future benefits, what are the current benefits of OLIF and lateral surgery? So I'd like to talk about really where it's going, not so much where it's been or where we're going. We've talked a lot about approaches. Um, the objectives are uh, the, well, the discussion between trans psoas and, and anti psoas. It goes on and on and on, and uh, let's, let's have some discussion about that. Single position is rocking into the world of lateral and revolutionizing it, so I think it's important to talk about that. That seems to be where things are moving. And then, of course, then it's always, like, what's next? What's next? So uh, just to remind us, we started with Mayer's mini incision. Uh, there was some endoscopic, but nothing really changed in lateral to the revolutionary uh, trans psoas, but uh, some of the faculty that are here, in fact, all the faculty that are here, th this changed everything. It just transformed how we thought about surgery, opportunities, options. So that's the beginning, I think, of the whole lateral effective history. And then uh, Dr. Rousselet actually coined the term OLIF, and I added to that the 5-1 level and then made it more MIS through a tube and uh, promoted that anti psoas approach, but on the shoulders of the trans psoas. So the first debate is, well, what, which technique is best? Is one better than another? What should we be doing? So there they are. They look very similar. We're doing the kind of the same implants in the same place with the same reason. We just get there a little different way, one through the psoas, one in front of the psoas. Uh, you know, one of the key benefits uh, of OLIF is that if you look at the bottom screen, you have a plate and inner body fixation, and all that can be done without invading the psoas at all. And so you see the psoas coming back over nicely intact, no injury to the psoas muscle whatsoever. That's one of the key advantages. I think avoiding the, uh, the iliac crest at L4-5 simply by moving the incision is, is I, you know, it's, it's not novel, it's just obvious. And I, there's no reason to struggle at L4-5 even if you go trans psoas. Just move the incision. And so that's a, that's a novel thing about both uh, techniques. The oblique corridor has been well established and there is a space in most cases between the psoas and the major vessels. Neuro monitoring cost, uh, as Dr. Teller said, oh, I did 400 and what, 50 or so cases there. They were all monitored by saphenous nerve. I was looking specifically at the femoral nerve and the, and the plexus when I did this, and there wasn't a single response from that machine and not any motor uh, issues whatsoever. So eventually I stopped using neuro monitoring, but it took me 450 olus in front of the cell to stop before I convinced myself that, that we don't need it. And you can use paralytics again, so we don't talk about that. But if you don't neuromonitor, you can use paralytics, and it's a much nicer dissection. This is a very big nerve, femoral nerve. It could be up to 13 millimeters in this specimen, L2 to L4 confluence, and it sits around the L3, 4, L4, 5 area. So stay anterior, that's the way to avoid it. I've seen it, I don't like it, and so I avoid it. This was my early D-lift uh, procedure, I came across it. The other advantage, ACR plus PCO equals PSO. I mean, we have had such a good opportunity here to see the anterior ligament, release it um, you know, carefully. This is showing how we can take it out, even around the sympathetic chain. You can see the chain sitting there on the right. It's almost always at the border of the lateral uh, ALL. And we can do this under direct visualization safely and then blunt dissection with uh, distractors after that and release. If you add that to a, 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 a PCO, in this case, this is just the anterior release, 20 degrees. If you add a PCO, you can add five or 10 more and you'll have a, a PSO equivalent. And even a, a, a good average surgeon at a community hospital can do this, but a PSO, that's a different story. That's a more advanced technique and hard to do. So uh, don't forget about you. If you feel good when you do surgery, you'll do it longer, you'll enjoy it, and you'll do a better job for your patient. The ergonomics uh, are not talked about enough. And one of the advantages of the uh, OLIF is on the abdominal side, and you get to uh, relax your neck, shoulders, and arms when you do the procedure. So all levels in one position. This was one of the first opportunities to have all levels in one position from L1 to S1. 
And in, you know, advanced degenerative disease, that's a very, very common problem, and it's a very, very powerful machine. Why is 5.1 important? Well, it's 40% of the radiographic pathology that we see. It's up to 40% of the lordosis that we treat, either maintain the lordosis or make lordosis. It's all happening down around 4.5 and 5.1. So uh, Dr. Uribe did a nice job with putting together a series of ALIF, uh, then trans soas and then anti soas But I summarized it. So ALIF, high fusion rate, high indirect decompression, Fairly low vascular injury if you're um, careful. Subsidence is low and low retrograde ejaculation at 2% if you stay retroperitoneal. Don't go transabdominal. Uh, so lateral surgery, well, there's no 5 1 level, so there's no vascular, but 97% fusion rate, high indirect decompression, temporary thigh paresthesia, subsidence, very acceptable, very good. OLIF brings back the 5 1 level, so you bring back some vascular issues. But again, a very high fusion rate, very good indirect decompression, a low vascular injury rate, and low subsidence with a temporary numbness. And then this, in this further study in 2020, reminded us that you can't, it actually has a lower vascular injury rate, but you can have ureter injuries, you can have sympathetic chain injuries. These things do occur in all these techniques and you have to always be on the look for them. But they're, they're not very common, thank goodness. Rick, so, Rick is it fair to, uh, I don't want to interrupt, is it fair to say, the I'm sorry, way, I can, I can, is it fair to say the way the ATP is done, they dissect everything in front of the service. It's actually exposed. Everything in front of the service is exposed. If you look at the way the ATP was done, they would expose the blood vessels, expose the sympathetic chain, expose everything. Which is why I think they're getting the injuries that they're getting. What do I love your comment on that? Uh, this is, I'm sorry, now I'm having a hard time picking up your question. Is the mic on? No, it is. I've got my hearings out today. I got blocked ear. Now I was saying, do you think dissecting and exposing the blood vessels and the sympathetic chain, is that a good idea or a bad idea when you're doing pre psoas When you're doing pre psoas you really don't see the sympathetic chain unless you're along the anterior ligament. There's small branches that you can take. The major branch is right along the lateral border of ALL. I mean, it's not an issue. You can right. see it. So uh, it's not a problem. Then, you know, the, in my series of, with our group, uh, almost 2,000 OLIFs, almost uh, no ileus, a low vascular injury rate, very minimal transfusion, uh, retrograde ejaculation almost gone. You, we have seen a lymphocele and sympathetic chain warm leg and uh, sympathetic, uh, uh, I'm sorry, superior mesenteric syndrome, I don't think related to the procedure. And not on the screen, we've had uh, over the last 10 years, two ureter injuries. You, they were both in revisions and they were tough cases and one recognized and one unrecognized, both resolved, uh, no problem. But overall, a, a, a very good um, rate of 6.7%. And then, but I draw attention to the retrograde ejaculation. You know, every one of these 5-1 levels had BMP. Every single one. So if anyone believes, truly believes that BMP causes retrograde ejaculation, what am I doing? Why am I doing so well? Okay, I just have to bring that point up. But also, you know, there's three cases we found. I'm going to assume that we missed two-thirds. We couldn't we didn't find the patient. Nobody told us. We didn't ask the right question. But even if you bring it up to 1%, it's still half what we're seeing in midline ALIF. And the reason is because we don't retract the super hypergastric plexus. That is why we're not getting the high rates of retrograde. So fusion rate, and whether you look at it by level or patient, is exquisitely high with these uh, lateral procedures. So whether you're going trans psoas or you're going anterior to the psoas, we're getting tremendous uh, lordosis, sagittal balance. We're getting great multi-level uh, cases done, we're getting an extremely high fusion rate and a low complication rate. That's a very, very good operation. So why are we struggling so much between these two procedures? You know, I think of Olaf more like Elon Musk's truck, it's probably a little more powerful, uh, a little biased on my part, but at the end of the day, these are two good techniques. Obviously, they, they have been validated in the literature. Do what is best, do what you're good at. Let's, let's use them both effectively. 
And so I think that debate needs to move on. And just let's let's uh, if we find something out that's good or bad about either technique in the future, fine, bring it back. But I think the more exciting debate is how is lateral surgery positioned for the future? So debate number two, single position is flipping out. Okay, cute play of words, but literally single position surgery wants to get rid of the flip. And whether it's lateral single position, whether it's single position prone, or the way I like to do it, uh, the surgeon stays in single position. So, you know, this may have started with lateral surgery with, with facet and, and then disc in 2013. It moved to the actual screws and disc. But the benefits are very, very big. It's big it eliminates the flip, dollars and time. You get to do lateral implants laterally, and you have access to L5S1 in the lateral position. This is very good. But lateral alone has some compromises. You're placing the screws in the lateral position, and the robots and navigation really make a big difference. But they can help us with decompressions. And we need to do decompression uh, from time to time. And we lose uh, the T-lift. A T-lift is a powerful and necessary operation. Most surgeons do T-lift. Maybe 20% will use an A-lift. We can't give up our T-lift. Uh, so, you know, looking at the prone, prone, I think all, all the people on the, uh, on the right have been here today. So this, this is where it's being promoted. And it has a lot of potential. I think there's tremendous benefits in eliminating that flip, flipping out market. Uh, lower doses is enhanced. Screws in the prone position, ideal. Decompression osteomies are back. T-lift at L5S1. This is a very powerful message. There are compromises, and, and this has to be val validated. But visualization is not as good as being lateral. Navigation and cameras do help. Cages are placed prone, not the way I want to do them. I, you can do it, but I'd rather be lateral looking down. And patient positioning at 4 or 5 is still an issue with the iliac crest, but that can be resolved. Retractor drift, it sounds like there's some resolution I heard about today, which is good. We can fix that. Ergonomics, not I don't think as good as being lateral, but it's doable. And uh, you, the 5-1 anterior the psoas is gone. Now, we lost the anterior approach, but we gained back the T-lift. So we moved to 2018. I look back at this. I was doing O-lift and mid-lift um, a long time ago, and I wanted to put them together and eliminate the flip, but I couldn't figure it out. I had a prototype uh, patient positioning system here, and then I have a class one FDA device here. And I'm the only one that has this. I'm not selling anything. I'm just showing you what I do. Uh, I think it's ergonomic for the surgeon to be in one position, and, and I want to do lateral surgery laterally, and I want to do prone surgery prone, and I want to go back and forth. So that's what I can do, and I think that's part, I add this into the possible future of single position, because I think it really enhances lateral surgery. There's benefits, same cost and time, ergonomics, cages in lateral position, screws are prone, decompression and osteotomies are back, all levels in one position, Movement of the patient is good. This, you know, what, do, what do we do with quadriplegics? Our patients, when they're asleep, are quadriplegic. It's equivalent, right? They can't move themselves. They're stuck. So when you move this patient around physiologically, you're moving the lungs, the heart. You're un unloading pressure points. It's a good thing to do in surgery rather than frozen for hours at a time. And then the T-lift or ATP at L5. So now this is what I like. Where If I want to do a T-lift, I'll do a T-lift. If I want to go uh, A-lift, I'll do an A-lift. I like having all the options on the table. So, but there are compromises in any technique, and it takes a little bit longer to position this than going prone. One of the, one of the advantages of prone is that you can position quicker than lateral. Uh, it takes a little bit longer, but not much. And of course, you have to have that system, which d doesn't really, it's not there yet for prime time. Um, it took about 30 minutes from the time anesthesia says go to the time we're actually operating. So. A well worth it. There was 462 patients, and this is a feasibility series, I call, because I think it's dangerous to move a patient 90 degrees in space and try to maintain sterility, and it takes a long time to be sure that that's safe and reasonable to do. But I think at 462 patients, this is the scorecard. I mean, we haven't even had an abrasion. 
let alone, I, I thought IVs would get pulled out, the Foley would get pulled out. Uh, we'd have issues from anesthesia and higher infection rate perhaps, but nothing's happened in all those patients. So I think it's going beyond the feasibility at this point. But the bottom line message here is all single position methods save time and money. Well, if we looked at how much that is, we calculated in 20 patients how, many, how much we were disposing in the single position flip versus doing it in the same day or another day. We are at $885 per case in disposables. You don't realize how much gets thrown out. So that's per case. Well, we also have determined that somewhere between $7 and $113 per minute is the OR cost for, to a hospital. Employees, salaries, electricity, rent, whatever. They all have a number. My hospital's number is $62. We used to flip really fast because we did it for so many years. A 35-minute flip, saving $62, $2,100 a case for the flip cost to the hospital. Add it to the disposables. This is saving $3,000 per case for my hospital. So I looked back and, and I went and I got myself a new robot when I showed them this. And I showed them what we had done for them with those 462 patients on that bed. So we multiplied that, 462 times 3,000 per flip. I showed them I saved them $1.4 million in just that small group of patients. But more importantly, multiply the time, 270 hours of additional surgery time that you could be doing something else or reduced anesthesia time for the patients. Very, very powerful movement to single position. And whichever one of this, because they all do this, it doesn't matter which one you, you like or you do. So in summary, we've got debate one. You know, we've got two great lateral surgery methods. Um, I think debate two, single position, has lots of options and there may be more, I think, possible. But Single position lateral has a prone challenger. I think that the, the prone has got a reasonable basis, uh, the, the foundation's coming in, but it's got a challenger. Um, of course, with my bias, I think I can get both, I can do both of them with this uh, single position of the surgeon. So debate number three, what are the implications for simultaneous access with the movement to single position? Well, what, what's, what is single position? Just about eliminating the flip and that's the whole deal? I don't think so. That was never what I was thinking about. It's simultaneous access. Well, is simultaneous access just two surgeons or two people working at once? That's great workflow and that's good, but is that it? Or is there more? What about simultaneous manipulation? So oh, good old Francis Dennis 40 years ago described the three columns of the spine theory. So if we can approach the anterior column and the posterior column, we can control the spine and control the angulation. So simultaneous manipulation. I believe it decreases injury to the end plates and bone screw loosening, two things that we face. So injury to the end plates, subsidence, bone screw loosening, pseudoarthroses, painful hardware. Working in parallel, not in series. Parallel, doing both at the same time. Just a case example of severe stenosis and a grade one spondy, degenerative disease, CT. So I, I want to show you what I did with this case. I used the, my table with a CBT, cortical bone trajectory, prone position. Robot loves this, this trajectory. All three robots I have used, Mazor, Excelsius, Remy, all three of them to work, work, work better with medialized screws. Uh, through small inci open incision. Perk doesn't matter, you can do any, any, any of them. So we did that and then rotated the table. It takes about 15 seconds. This is a thigh bolster down below if you need to uh, protect the thigh. And that just pushes out of the way, exposing the uh, anterior approach or lateral approach. And there we uh, took out the 5-1, um, the, the technique I showed this morning. And, and the implants getting in place. Now, this is probably the most important part of it. If you look at the uh, slide on the left, as we're impacting this uh, implant, we've tightened the S1 nut. We haven't popped it off, we tightened it, and we kept loose the two nuts above. It's fascinating to look at the top with a rod, because what's happening is we're actually distributing the force of distraction, and we're pushing the screws along a lordotic rod. So now the screws and rod and inner body implant anteriorly are all working together to share the stress of changing the lordosis. 
Now, that is something we can start thinking about doing because we have single position. We couldn't even begin to think about things like this if we didn't have single position. Now, which way you like to do it? So that I'm fascinated with. I've done a whole bunch of cases like this, and it always looks like that. The trick is make sure you put enough rod on the end. I've done a couple where I've run out on three and four levels, and I didn't have enough length on the rod. Had to go back and change it. So after that, we locked them. Uh, and then this is what it looks like. I took one off. So you can see, that was the extent of the, the length of the rod. And when we were done, that was the rod. So, but it's not just a rod, it's a lordotic rod. So those screws are forced to, to migrate and translate along a lordosis, along with a trapezoidal implant. So I can see a lot of interesting um, constructs, in, uh, implants, tools in the future that could facilitate simultaneous manipulation via simultaneous access. Uh, so at 5.1, this is what happened, zero degrees to 12. Look at the top of the rod, how it changed. And then we go to L4.5. We had eight degrees, 12 degrees change, and the rod almost disappeared on us there. So this is what's happening with simultaneous manipulation. 23 degrees between the screws, just to look at them, 30 there and 33, and then a global change uh, that's significant but it was spread across all of the constructs. So I think at the end of the day, there'll be less subsidence, less end plate injury, and less bone screw loosening. And then at the very end, we decide we go back, just push a button, and 10 seconds, we're back to the back, and we uh, then go back to the final, final screw tightening, lock down the screws, and we're done. So simultaneous manipulation, I think that's gonna be something fun to, for us to, to work with. Debate number four is really more generic. So what is all this enabling technology doing in lateral surgery for me and Olaf and trans and the rest? What about all that stuff? Well, first thing that's good are all these different positioning systems that allow us to do single position. It's enabling technology and it's very, very uh, powerful whether you do it prone or lateral or, or with a table like this. But circling around is also 3D imaging, robotics. I've used all three of those. Uh, the re the, uh, the uh, augmented reality is fascinating. Um, and then AI. So is any of this really a value to us and it's costly and expensive and it's fidgety? Do we should we invest in this in the, in the lateral surgery world? I'm gonna say absolutely yes. Uh, for me, being an older surgeon, the technology as, it, as I take the time to learn it, it markedly decreases mental and physical ergonomics. Mental and physical. Not just your body, how hard you work, what position. What about your brain? If I don't have to think about where screws go, because I've already planned it, and they go exactly where I want them, because my physician's assistant puts them all in, I don't do it. I'm busy orchestrating the rest of the surgery. This is powerful, powerful tools, and I think it belongs in, in the lateral world. Another way of looking at it is from the art of war. Victory belongs to the side that scores most in temple calculations before battle. Makes sense. Plan your battle in the battle room, not on the battlefield. And that's all about preoperative planning, and that's what all the robotics is about. And then my mentor, uh, Dr. White, um, 40 years ago, said, stick with your preoperative plans and contingencies. Improvisation is best less for the research laboratory. Don't go into a case and try to figure it out. Have it all figured out in advance. So that was 40 years ago. He didn't even have a cell phone yet let alone a robot. We have robots that we can pre-plan with. And then the best surgeons carefully plan their operations and review the anatomy. I heard that five times a day. You've got to know the anatomy. You can't do enough study of the anatomy. And then measure. Measure intraoperative forces because that makes a difference in how things come out at the end. So the current thoughts, debate one, these are two excellent procedures. And we're lucky to have two approaches. Uh, for the lateral surgery, use what's best for you and what you've been taught. Check. Bait number two. Single positioning transforms the ergonomics and economics of lateral surgery. So I think single position needs to be focused on, whether it's, it's, it's prone, prone's very promising, lateral, other methods, but single positioning. And then, of course, debate number three. The, what did the lateral approach do that Dr. Preventa introduced? Well. <laughs> it led to single positioning. That's where we are. What did that lead to? Simultaneous access. But that's not just a workflow phenomenon. That leads to simultaneous manipulation. 
truly a new way to absolutely address the three columns of the spine. So I think that's exciting. I, I love where that's going. And then debate number four, simply enabling technologies, in my mind, mental and physical ergonomic transformation. I, I just don't even want to go to the R without a robot and all the other uh, tools I have now. So the future of lateral surgery, everything's on the table. Thank you. You get my pun, right? Everything's on the table? On my table? All right, good. OK, you see my cigar, right? Yeah. Uh, all right. It's harder to see the That's wine That's the glass. idea, mental ergonomics. I'm having a cognac and a cigar, and we're, <laughs> we're doing advanced surgery. Why can't we enjoy it? It's, if we pre-plan it, it's fun. So any questions about that? Any, um, I know it's getting late in the day, and we probably want to move on. It is interesting that you, you, you have this con uh, concept of not only simultaneous procedure, but simultaneous manipulation of both columns at the same time. Uh, we are learning now with the, with the prolateral that uh, in some cases that we wouldn't do lateral because it was a spongy grade two, for instance. Uh, now, because the patient is in prone, we, we do the reverse. I would say that lateral became more, more important, uh, less important than before. It's just part of the surgery. Uh, mm -hmm. It's only your access to the anterior column. It, the surgery itself is the two columns together. Yeah, thank you. I, 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 to I totally agree. I think that the, you know, it's, it's to, in my mind, it's all about doing surgery that is not applying excessive force, not pushing anything, not just everything's gentle, and then getting big correction. And the being only, confident of it. The only thing that is lacking in your, in your uh, high-tech room is the EOS. I've got that my, in my office, actually. <laughs> I have an EOS, uh, and I love it. EOS is great. It's great. No, but I think that the future of EOS is not in the office. The future of EOS is not a radiological tool that will plan your surgery. The future of EOS will be on the OR. So the EOs on the OR, coupled with navigation and robotic, will not only understand the alignment needed, control the, under, the, the alignment during the procedure, and control before the patient wake up. You know, it's interesting, the Excelsius robot, there's, there's, they have a, I think it's Globus, uh, I'm not advocating for anything, but that new CT scanner uh, they have can turn sideways, and technically, you could stitch in the in the OR the entire spine with that with that scanner. I don't have it, but I studied it, and I, for the same reason, I like to know what my angulation is. Where am I in the OR? Yeah. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>